This is my uh, very first Autumn Sphere. I joined the faculty last year, and thank you, Jay, for inviting me as the moderator. Um, so please join me to welcome our uh, speaker, El Elizabeth Cristoforati from uh, the univers uh, Harvard University. Um, <laughs> Jay told me to keep this introduction short, so I find it quite challenging given her achievements. Um, so. Professor Elizabeth, um, she is a pro uh, assistant professor in practice of architecture um, at the Graduate School of Design. She leads the Laboratory for Design Technologies at Harvard and also Supernormal, a design studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her design practice research and teaching explores the culture, uh, implication of large data sets, human-computer interactions or collaboration um, and scalable system of design. I encourage you to visit our website to take another look of um, Professor Elizabeth's profile and also engage with her uh, during on Zoom and also in person. Thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So the workaround is I'm gonna be reading my speaker notes here. Um, so yes, this is in fact me. I'm Elizabeth Cristoforetti, um, and thank you for the kind introduction. I think we've covered the next two, great, yes. Okay, um, so a huge thank you to the conference organizers um, for having me here and for bringing up this incredible topic. I think it's, it's so timely and so important and I'm honored to be a part of the conversation. Um, so as, as was mentioned, I, I, I research at the uh, Graduate School of Design at Harvard, and I run a practice called Supernormal, and uh, I'm, I'm a little obsessed with this question of agency in both of those realms. I take the stuff in, in research, that's the things that um, I can't quite get clients to pay me for, right? Those are things that either have um, too far of a time spectrum to make sense for the models of practice, um, or they're not directly profitable. Um, and then in practice, I test out things that we can really make happen in the real world and trying to figure out how we can advance those and make them go further and, and, and more to meet the imperatives of our time is, is very important to me. All right, so I've broken this down into three sort of sections here. The first one is sort of like a setting out of terms. The second one talks about research and some of the work I've been doing recently with some other colleagues as well. And the third is um, maybe something about how we might move forward in practice. So agency, I think, is something like the capacity to act and make change. We could probably all agree upon that. Um, but what we are acting in the service of and what the sort of good is for us as designers um, is something that I think needs to be talked about a little bit more. Like we take it for granted that we all know what the good is, but it's, it's not quite that easy, I think. Um, I'm not advancing the slides because they're on agency. To what end? <laughs> OK. Yes, all right. So we, in fact, are already making massive change all the time. We have a lot of agency in practice. We dial into efficiency to make design more scalable and profitable for our clients who we serve, right? That's what we do. It's our job. Um, and it's worth acknowledging that as a profession, we are service providers to clients. They hire us to create profitable assets, and we are accountable to our profession, which prioritizes, I think, directly quoting from the AIA, which is the um, Architects Institute of America, the health, safety, and welfare of humans. So we follow codes to ensure that these values are upheld. Uh, Layla, at last night, spoke about the consequences and challenges of the market um, at the product scale. And I suppose these market-driven building types are the architectural analog. I don't know if any of you have had internships yet, but sometimes it can feel like buildings are designing themselves. Um, uh, you know, right now it can feel a little bit like we are executing an optimization algorithm, and they always look the same, like this, yes? Um, so in all fairness, uh, and I, through experience, it is really hard not to design this building that you see up on screen. Um, while also maintaining a fiduciary responsibility to your client, so making sure that they are getting what they need out of the project, which is usually profit, um, and operating according to both local and international regulations. At the same time, it's important to say out loud that we as designers are in fact agents 
uh, and the amplification of existing value systems, right? The value systems in this case is, you know, I'm being oversimplifying, but the market and the regulatory infrastructure. Where am I pointing? Up? Here? Yeah. Um, so the world is, in fact, full of complexity, right? We've been talking about this for the past two days. Um, these are the imperatives of our time. We've been discussing them. The conditions that are bigger than a client or a code, they require a different kind of attention and design agency. So our design output, if you're an architect, it's, it's actually drawings, but we're, you know, we're trying to design beautiful buildings, is misaligned with this attention. So we know, for example, that buildings in construction are responsible for almost 40% of global emissions with carbon, right? That's not super helpful in confronting these things. Bear with me while I awkwardly try to navigate my notes in a new and weird way. <laughs> okay, so if we wanna be agents of a different kind of change, it seems important to discuss what we really want out of our agency, to daylight the value systems that drive the design of the built environment today, to identify that good, right, for ourselves as a precursor to action and for future design. So what values should we serve? Uh, what do we want out of this? Do we want money? I mean, I do. I want to be able to pay for my kids to go to college. Do we want cultural relevance? Yes, I want that too. Um, or do we want to put nature back into the condition in which we found it? That seems unlikely. Um, so it's very complicated. For instance, if we value the environment, we have to pose the question, should we be building anything at all? Um, or just in general, what should we be making? So our stated values drive the disposition of our built world, um, the values that we bring to the table. They shape the relationships and conditions within it, and they're the foundations for agency and design. I like this diagram. I made it a few years ago. Um, the general idea being that we operate, let's see if my, yes, okay. Can you guys see that little red thing? Great. Um, so this is where we live as architects. We live at the project level. We make things in the world and they tend to be projects. Um, these are the big problems that we're talking about today. And we don't get to control those through one project, right? And sometimes we don't really get to control them at all because in fact, it's, it's these guys, the constructs, the, the infrastructures of power and inst institutional and other power that operate in our built environment, capital stacks, technology stacks, and policy frameworks that, that guide and shape the, the work that we do. Um, so these, our relationships with these infrastructures of power right in the middle deserve um, a certain amount of attention. We need to understand them better. Um, and we need to figure out how to operate, I think, not just in this direction where this tells this what to do, but now we need to be able to op operate back and forth between them. And I think that that will give us a better chance at agency. It's just a very uncomfortable way of operating as a designer because that's not what we're used to doing. We're used to being given an RFP and responding to it, a request for proposals, right? It's a little different. Frankly, I think the uh, profession could use some interrogation as well. Um, we have created a profession in, um, in, in a different time than we live in right now, and uh, therefore it has a sort of different set of values, and we might consider whether the rules of gameplay are still functional in our current climate. So, so basically, like, we do have to just start asking some bigger questions, right? Okay. So the nature of design agency is a function of time and conditions, and our conditions are, are changing quickly. I've been thinking a bit about how our understanding of our context is changing and what it means for us, how we see the world, how we respond as designers, uh, and what we decide to make, how we decide to make it, so on and so forth. Um, and it's very overwhelming. This complexity issue is uh, very extreme. Uh, and in a sort of strangely optimistic way, I, I think it's an inflection point where we can do very exciting things on the other side. Um, so I'm gonna speak for the next few minutes about an exhibition that I designed and curated a few months ago. It's called Our Artificial Nature. Um, and it was a really nice and unexpected opportunity that sort of um, materialized uh, in a very short time before the exhibition opened. Um, as an, It was for me an opportunity to consider the context for design now and our, the changing nature of our relationship to it. So to make some observations about where our agency as designers might lie. 
It was um, somewhat diagnostic with respect to the state of design practice and an opportunity to think about its structural potential. So um, how we organize ourselves, how we decide what we want to become and who uh, and what we will become it with, right? I think Indy was talking about becoming with. The starting place was an enormous pile of emerging and ongoing research by design faculty. These were from the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning and design, and design engineering. And it was an enormous amount of work. Um, so the goal really was to bring to light some, of, some larger narratives, which I honestly thought I was going to have to post-rationalize. I was like, this is a huge amount of work from all of these people. They're so talented. They're doing radically different things in totally different disciplines. And I was wrong. There was no post-rationalization needed. The second we put the materials out on the table, um, that narrative fit together very, very clearly. And I was incredibly heartened because what it meant is all of us in our little silos, working alongside each other in the same building and hardly ever talking to each other about our work, are somehow pointing towards something aligned from very different perspectives. But we're doing it and we're kind of all rowing in the same direction. So I'm going to share that with you now. OK. Um, it felt important then, and it feels important now as well, to sort of set out a working position on design at the, the start. Um, design is dialogic. That means that it is a conversation, and it's always changing. It's a conversation that's being had in this room and in on my campus and between all of us over Zoom, right? And it's changing in relationship to our context. It is biased. I grew up in Miami, Florida. I come from a military family. I had really healthy food when I was little because my mother would never let us eat junk food. Like I have a very specific worldview. And because design comes out of me and because design comes out of you, it is fundamentally biased. And that's not a bad thing as long as it stays in check, but it is, it's a thing. Design is by and for humans and it's a search for meaning. Yes, what we do impl is impacts the world around us, but at the end of the day, I believe, and we can maybe have a debate about this later, I think at the end of the day, it's actually about humans. And ultimately, design is the creation of the artificial. It's the capacity to imagine and grow our world is both the cause of our escalating environmental plight and the means by which we confront it. So there's something optimistic there. I think it's a very realistic idea about what it is. Um, just one more note on this artificial thing. I really do think that we make the artificial in a, in a really beautiful way. You know, we make and imagine the future. It's our highest and best use. We channel the kind of world that we want to inhabit and the physical stuff of our built environment that is meaningful, the meaningful context for our life together in society. So this is very powerful. Okay. Now, the context that we live in now seems like it's changing to me, not just physically, but also culturally. I mean, it's always changing, right? But there's a sort of bigger shift right now. Um, and there's another meaning to the, this theme, our artificial nature. By the way, it has a, it has a couple of meanings. Um, the, the first is um, a, a reference to the emerging imperative of artificial intelligence, um, as well as our current context for design, which I'll cover in a moment. But it's also you know, a reference, as I mentioned, to the role that designers play in society as creators of the artificial. OK, so this third meaning, our artificial nature, as the context in which we operate right now, this is our surroundings. In the face of overwhelming waste and an economic paradigm that drives us towards more and bigger design production and the carbon emissions that come with it, our relationship in, with our surroundings is shifting. Our understanding of nature as a bucolic landscape to be either dominated or restored by means of human invention is no longer functional as a platform for design. So this is a shift in worldview, and it has been covered by our previous speakers. And this is an image um, from an industrial era moment. Oh, you know, I have all of the... Um, very responsible with my citations, and you can't see them. Um, but they're there. This is by George Innes. Um, it's the Lackawanna Valley, and um, it's from the sort of industrial moment of the 1850s to 1900. Okay. So in recent history, our concept of environmental change has been based in binaries, making the natural into the artificial, setting up not humans to serve human ends, understanding local intelligence as a threat to global scalability. And there's a growing awareness of our context as something else, as an entangled system of biological, cultural, social, and technological relationships in which we play some part. Our world is now a synthetic confluence of human and non-human. And here, um, we can think of non-human systems as both biological and machine, so like dogs and AIs, yeah? 
Um, so the context or condition of our world framed in this way shifts the role of design from first responder or crisis manager or even hero or villain, which I often feel, you know, like we're kind of, cr you know, crammed into these roles. Um, it shifts us from, from these kind of extreme roles in the face of crisis to some other and more collaborative role in the imagination of a shared and hybrid future world. Even though the stakes are high, and we know they are, I think this non-binariness actually takes some pressure off. It makes room for something, and I don't know exactly how to say this, so I'm going to say it a little bit awkwardly. It makes room for something that is soft and connected, and I think it allows us the space to look and listen and to follow our intuition, which in an era of um, user-centered design and design thinking, I feel like we've lost a little bit. So the condition liberates design research and practice to re-see the world through the lens of previously invisible data and systems to operate in new ways and with new human and non-human companions to imagine altogether an altogether different kind of output. So the idea here is that these are the binaries, right? Natural, artificial, and in fact, now we're kind of pulling them together. Okay. And the video's working. Miracle. Miracle. <laughs> Okay, so the floating green words are the works in research um, and design research feature in the exhibition. Um, each is keyed to a starting date and each has a kind of proclivity or attraction to one of these three themes that you see here. Um, so the, the, um, the, the themes, and as we were sort of shifting through the research, these are the things that like jumped out at, at us as we were looking through it. Um, the first one was continuously becoming design, so I'll, I'll describe each of these, but this one's something about data and more than human design. The second one is called degrowth and regrowth, something about methods for encountering design in relationship to capitalism and scale. And the third, we named methods, standards, and protocols. So this is something about designing processes instead of artifacts as a way to daylight the value systems driving design. Okay, so first, methods, standards, and protocols. Um, this theme explores modes of re-seeing or analyzing our existing world within this new paradigm. And by the way, the reason why I'm talking about this is that I actually think that all of this stuff that's already happening in uh, all of our rooms in, uh, at, the, at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, all of the rooms here, the conversations that we've been having today, I actually think this is pointing a pretty clear picture forward, and, I, and it's exciting. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna articulate them a little bit more. So this form of design research utilizes large and small data sets to visualize otherwise unseen conditions, daylight systemic values, and to advocate for changes in policies, standards, and me the mechanics that shape our environment. This is research by Pablo Perez Ramos. He uses drone-captured thermal, thermal analysis to reveal the oasis as something of an ancient technology that continues to sustain agricultural practices in conditions of extreme aridity. So these are places where people live that are really dry. So this mode of seeing a slowly but continuously changing and evolving form of design. In this case, a continuously modulated relationship between human inhabitants, the landscape, and climate over centuries of change points to a fundamental set of design strategies that can be replicated or modeled in other conditions with the goal of both climatic resilience and meaningful human life. So this is like a total collaboration between nature and humans. It's like literally like the computer of like like thousands of years ago. It's kind of remarkable. Come on, yes, okay. Is Gareth here? Gareth, are you here? This is Gareth's work. Gareth is speaking next. Um, so uh, this mode of work uh, uh, is focused on the creation of processes rather than artifacts, the premise being that we need to re-see the complex world to understand the invisible constructs that are shaping the path dependencies of design before we can remake or regrow it. Um, so here Gareth is speculating on processes of qualitative and quantitative analysis that aims to both mitigate increasing urban temperatures and amplify the identity and experience of a place. This method of re-seeing focused on the use of color in urban places enables a more creative process and an interconnected design mindset that intersects environmental, social, and experiential dimensions of a condition. It embraces the hybridity of our natural, social, and cultural worlds as a position for design agency, which I think is wonderful. I hope I got it right. Great. Um, that's the way I see it. 
Okay, and this is research by Craig Douglas, Rose Monacella, and Malkit Shoshan. It builds upon the sim a similar logic by layering in historically marginalized dimensions of the social and cultural landscape. They are imagining a process, in addition to analysis, to yield actionable and repeatable awareness of the layered impact that infrastructural change will yield in a transition to renewable energy production. The research questions and, um, uh, and, and these maps make visible the actors and agencies involved, forms of governments, territorial demarcations, land use, ecosystems, historical events, material flows, processes, right? The things that shape um, the ever-evolving form of energy production. So if any of you have studied Ian McCarg in the en environmental design course, yes? In Ian McCarg, layering, sorry, yeah, yes, okay, a few. Um, this is like Ian McCarg, like super amplified. Because now they're also layering in things that we can't see. Um, they're layering in, I think, as Indy would say, the dark matter and also human experience. Um, so this work daylights and makes visible the invisible systems that intersect and overlap to create the DNA of our synthetic world. And I think actually that the design of methods and processes within this larger theme is kind of the opposite of highly authored form, which is what I grew up learning in, in architecture school. It's Definitely anti-heroic and definitely anti-autonomous. Um, we also featured work, historic works, to be able to sort of situate and frame everything. Um, we featured things from our archives, um, Archigram, the Eames, um, and many others as a way to highlight our connections and response to history. This is work by June Jordan and Buckminster Fuller, um, and we see, I think remarkably, how similar ambitions in two different times yield two radically different forms of architecture. Um, so this is a, a little known work that was published in 1965. It's focused at design operating at the intersection of social justice and environmental change. Um, it was published in Esquire of all places. It stands in stark contrast um, to the significantly less heroic work on sustainable and affordable housing within our exhibition to the right, um, which I'll talk about later, uh, which operates by filling in small gaps in co and <clears throat> excuse me, co-opting invisible infrastructures of capital and data to provide bottom-up mechanism for change. So I think maybe what we're seeing on the left is this, is this moment of modern heroicism, right? These are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to give people better housing and they're trying to fix environmental problems using energy actually, both of them. And one of them is all about systems and the other one is all about this kind of like mega form, right? And it's just, we're just in a totally different moment right now and I, I, it feels very fresh and exciting. Um, it's something m right now, I think, maybe more quiet but vast through integral links to systems and networks. Okay, so that'll do it for our, if I can change the slide, yeah, okay. So the next theme is called continuously becoming design. So the, the DNA of design is, is changing also from a sort of digital and physical perspective. The stuff behind the walls of architecture is not just physical load-bearing structure anymore. It is also data and a crazy amount of invisible systems that are in constant motion. This is a diagram of house zero. It's a lab um, on the campus at Harvard University. Um, Ali Makawi runs it, it's called house zero. And the, what you see here is effectively a systems diagram of the house. The house is ingesting data from the web. It's ingesting weather data. It's ingesting data in from its own internal sensors. It's then relaying that information. It's processing it, and it's actually responding to it. So then it's like automatically opening and closing windows, turning on and off heat systems, right? This is like a very, very different thing. This house is always changing, and it's changing without humans. It's doing it on its own. It's a continuously becoming and changing thing that is responding to all different kinds of flows of information and data. And the goal here, of course, is to optimize energy use um, and to reduce the carbon footprint. So again, this becomes this kind of um, question, I think, a little bit about how these, the creation of all these technologies that got us into this mess in the Industrial Revolution are probably also a, a decent pathway out. So we need to to embrace them and figure out what this new kinds of architecture is. Um, what you see, he oh, you don't see it because it didn't switch. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is continuously changing in response to its context and it's important for a few reasons. Uh, when, and by the way, you what you're seeing here is a continuous readout of all of the, the data that's being produced in house zero. See what you will about smart homes and smart houses and so on and so forth, but you cannot deny 
that there is something dramatically different in a house like this and what's behind its walls than there was for Leger's, you know, primitive hut or something like this, right? This is a very, very different kind of thing. And what you see here is the data readout, and then behind it is a window into a window, actually. It's a projection. Um, uh, it's a window into a projection of a window that's showing it open and close in response to the data. Okay. Um, and this, uh, this is a wall of common building sensors, relays, and processing devices. And the goal here was to daylight the invisible mechanics that operate out of sight, as well as the, um, they, they become kind of change agents in their own right. And I think we spoke, I already heard the conversation move towards disciplinary stuff in the last conversation. And I think it's true that, you know, we can't be experts in everything, but we certainly do have to understand the way that um, buildings are operating in relationship to, to data information and like the stuff that's actually recording them. So we kind of like ripped them out of walls and stuck them on another wall and created a diagram to kind of show how everything was operating. Um, so what we do as designers is obviously changing. Um, and as our tools and media change, our relationship to society and our world also changes. And so do our design processes. So um, this is a traditional design process. This is like um, Alberti, this architect, a long time ago in Italy. He was like, listen, architects have ideas. We're really different than the guild people. We don't, we don't build stuff, we've got ideas. So what we do is we, um, we author things, we author ideas, we come up with ideas, and we draw them, and we model them, and uh, we, it's, we, we can do this with authority because we have a lot of education and knowledge and skill. And uh, that's going to be turned into pieces of representation that are going to do a building, right? So just is like single architect, author, building. Yeah? Easy. Not so easy anymore. Because now um, an architect has to, I mean, all of these sensors and information and data, it's, it's a lot of stuff in this complexity. We have to be now operating in relationship not only to the building, which is not just a building anymore, it's building and data, they're physical digital hybrids. Um, we also have to be thinking about all of our other stakeholders and all of the other uh, relationships that we have within all of this, the computers and the data, um, our communities, consultants, collaborators, right? The, the biological systems that are operating within our projects. Um, so it's, it's, it's undoubtedly a, a much different game than we were playing. Um, and I, 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 I suspect that means that the architecture might have to change as well. Um, and so I, I think one of the questions on the table for us as we think about where our agency lies is something about the nature of our relationships with humans and non-humans in design practice. Um, I, I, I think um, Donna, oh, I'm, you know what? You guys aren't seeing any of this, I'm not switching the slides. Look at that, see old, new. It's so different. Hold on, you're gonna see the new and be amazed. There we go, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, here we go. Human-human um, collaboration, human-machine collaboration. Um, it's a very, very different process, right? So now what we're doing is, is truly a, a lot of our energy has to go into the design of the process, not just the design of the building itself, and that's quite different. Okay, so, so this is, um, I, I, we've been talking a lot about becoming with, we've been talking about entangled relationships, we've been talking about multi-species companionship. This is coming from Donna Haraway, in case you guys weren't aware. I haven't heard her mentioned yet, but, um, but she's, she's important in this conversation. Um, and, and I think we need to think very carefully, maybe um, being, um, you know, carefully considering what she's writing about, um, how do we think about human and non-human collaboration? Um, how, how do we think about it? Are we partners, design partners? Are we companions, consultants? There was a whole paradigm of human-computer interaction a few decades ago in which the computer was the slave. And I, I think that's, that's not really making so much sense anymore. Um, so the goal here is to aim at a relationship characterized by symbiosis and ethical treatment of both humans and non-humans. And this extends to other forms of intelligence as well, so biological systems and animals as well. 
Okay, so this um, this is the third category. It's the last category, and it's the one that I find the most challenging theme. Um, we've called it degrowth and regrowth, and it picks up on this uh, last point about companionship between humans and non-humans and an awareness that we are changing together. So the theme takes on the paradigm of unlimited growth in a world of finite resources, digging into new ways of understanding the nature and potential of growth as, this histori as uh, the historic imperative of design practice. So degrowth is really an economic and social movement that evaluates the limits and impacts of capitalism, colonialism, and extractivism in our environment and society. It advocates for a shift away from continuous economic growth towards a model, model of social organization based upon non-market metrics of, of success. So a really simplistic translation of something like degrowth um, in design practice suggests that we should stop making things, right? But that's, I think, not so appealing from the perspective of our kind of collective quest for human meaning, nor is it practical in confronting the very real issues of things like the housing crisis. Um, but the arguments are not wrong. Um, a more sophisticated reading uh, indicated by emerging design research opens up the potential of growth to grow in, uh, of design to grow in different ways, to explore practices of gap filling in the urban fabric, to rebalance development in climate vulnerable communities, to account for new forms of risk and collective ownership, and to make greater use of latent and local intelligences. So work in this vein that we showed in the exhibition, um, it, it, it explored uh, very sort of rigorous research methods um, in, uh, with human and non-human species collaboration that ranged from machines to mangroves. So it was really quite, quite wide. And and remarkable. And it was about methods, but also design, um, physical design. So here, processes of decomposition and growth triggered by natural systems of heating and cooling are explored as potential pathways for design to operate. So at the left, there's a materials exploration into bricks that are created using algae. So that the um, that clay conversation that happened earlier, the, it, it's a very similar process, except instead of clay that comes out of the robotic arm, um, we're now uh, churning out algae. This is a um, this is under Martin Bechtold at the at the GSD. Um, so th this, is, this is a way of thinking about how we can fill in gaps with materials that are going to uh, decompose or recompose. Um, and at Wright, a research studio explores the design of delightful follies. So this is very much in keeping with this idea of human meaning and design imagination that operate in concert with surrounding biological and social systems. Okay, so a final note um, to close out this section. Um, the faculty research is incredibly uh, diverse in terms of, yep. Uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this says small and this says big. This says one-off and this says scalable. So the faculty research is all over the place in terms of scale. Some of them are operating at the nano scale and some of them are operating at the global scale. What was remarkable when we put them all together and put a little bit of data around it um, was that they were all kind of hovering up here. They were all aiming for some idea about replicability or scalability. Um, to operate within a system, to transfer knowledge across or between contexts, or because the work itself is a process rather than an artifact or a tangible form. So a picture of the structural potentials of design practice in relationship uh, to environmental change emerged quickly around this question. Um, the, what, I, what I think is, is fascinating is that there is this kind of merging of an ambition for both contextual sensitivity and scalable design impact. Um, so it feels important just um, as a last note to address this question of scale. Um, this 200, 2015 book by Anna Singh is, is an important reference and one that's interesting to try to translate in terms of um, operations and design. So the imperative of scale and scalability to reach, it, at least in my mind, um, the imperative of scale and scalability in design is something like to reach more places and people in need and to increase design agency has to be encountered through more than optimization, efficiency, and standardization. It, it doesn't really work for us to try to figure out how to achieve these things by copying metrics of, of the market, right? That, that doesn't, market dynamics won't, won't translate for us into design very well. Or you get the building that I showed at the very beginning of the deck. 
The possibility of, engage, of engaging with and designing with flexible and adaptable forms of organization that grow from friction, messiness, and un, the unpredictability of social and economic processes is extremely intriguing. Um, a relationship with scale that is not exponential but self-limiting. I am kind of obsessed with this idea that, um, that systems-linked design, the role of something like architecture or the project in systems-linked design is actually to cause friction. We have to somehow operate within and upon the system to create just enough friction within it that it provides us with, with meaning and contribution. I don't yet know exactly what that means, but I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, and it's a nice jumping off point for um, a few words about testing this out in practice. Um, so reseeing here is to encounter scale, to dial into contemporary messiness, messiness as a complex social, cultural, human, non-human, and economic condition. It's a process, it's, a, uh, it's, it's sort of process design, uh, in addition to architecture, is an act of care, criticism, and optimism. And then there's remaking, so how do we act in this context? And for me, this gets translated as systems integrated design, um, anti-heroic and anti-autonomous architecture, uh, and something about how we hold at the same time uh, human intuition and meaning on one hand, and then this question of like scale and systems on the other. It's like a little bit of a hard thing to juggle. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of works from my practice just to close it out. So um, Supernormal is my design firm, as I mentioned at the outset, and it's the place where I test out ideas uh, through projects and practice. I was feeling very low energy, low energy and low in agency when I started Supernormal. It's why Supernormal happened. Um, and it has become a platform to explore systems-linked architecture and scalable systems of design um, that are, you know, as I mentioned before, this trying to figure out how to handle this question of uh, anti-autonomy, uh, messiness, engagement, and, and process-based design as well. So some of the projects focus on reseeing the invisible stuff of the world using data as a kind of backbone uh, to, uh, uh, to something bigger or for a critique or to drive change. And some projects engage policy or the creation of technology, a kind of design that approaches the question of scale and scalability as something that is locally responsive and relevant in more than one place. And I suppose this is also an, a, a desire for agency. And it has so far been a blend of architecture, urbanism, and technology, sometimes installations and exhibitions. So there's, there's quite a diversity of media, um, and it's a work in progress for sure. It's a rather young firm, and it's a, a design project in its own right. Um, so I, I do want to say, though, I, that I, it's a project of optimism about our human capacity to create meaning, beauty, and change. I still believe in beauty, by the way. OK, there's some more buildings. So has anyone been to the seaport in Boston? No? OK, it's called an innovation district. Um, uh, a previous mayor of ours created it. Uh, lots of companies got tax incentives. There's some really big master developers involved. It was the largest, I think I'm right in saying it was the largest undeveloped land area in North America that was so proximate to an urban center. So it's a very, very valuable piece of land. It also happens to be effectively at sea level. Um, so what ended up happening is that the buildings all looked like all of those buildings that I showed, except now there's also some offices mixed in. Um, and we, I was looking, you know, during the pandemic, I was doing some, I was doing some research in uh, school. I was interested in, in these questions. This was in 2020 um, about, uh, uh, I, you know, I was interested in generative AIs. Who's not? It's very compelling. And I also happened to be doing some work, an adaptive reuse project in the seaport, at the very edge of the seaport, at the gateway. And I just started to look around at all these facades, and I was like, this is insane. How can we how can we use the how can we use AIs not just as a way to generate new images but actually to understand the patterns about what's already existed? So I wanted to kind of like reverse engineer it a little bit and see if we could figure out how to learn something about these facades. What is their DNA? What makes them tick? Is this something that we can think about doing? Um, I yeah, I, I think it could be. Oh, I didn't show you the facades, man. I'm really bad at this. Not. Sorry, I'm used to clicking one thing and then they both go, and um, I'm very bad at this. Okay, these, this is what the facades look like. 
Um, and so we collected a bunch of data. We went out and took a bunch of pictures of facades. And so, and then we trained up a little neural net and uh, you know, uh, we created a, a, a generative adver adversarial network model and uh, we wanted to see, honestly, what the question was. I kind of wanted to know, yes, about these patterns in DNA, but I wanted to know if we could make a continuously becoming seaport facade. Like, could we have an endless seaport facade that just continuously reproduces itself? And it turns out the answer is yes. Pretty good, huh? I think this is pretty good. I think the, I think the little model did a nice job. Um, and we did learn something about this. And um, it, it kind of inspired us to, um, to ap apply for a, a design competition. We ended up winning a design competition to do some public art in the seaport right around the corner from our actual project. Um, and we ended up, the, the award was a public art commission. So this became our jumping off point to um, bridge some curiosity around AI's market-driven urbanism, right, and this question of continuously becoming design um, into something physical in the world. Um, so, there, okay. We, uh, it, uh, we were operating as a design build, so we actually built this thing. It was, it was like 2021, it was February. It was so cold and sad in the pandemic, you guys down there. This was at the, um, it was at the, the gateway into the seaport, so it was a very, very public space. And it was a very, very big, it looked like a big building fragment that basically like fell off the corner of a building in the seaport and landed right next to the um, road, um, which was kind of cool, I think. And we projected on it, we spent a lot of time, I learned so much about projection um, we projected onto it this, um, the, the output of this AI. Um, so, I, you know, I, I did kind of want to diagnose architecture somehow to analyze it uh, and to understand it as it appeared in the world. Um, uh, and, I, yeah, I mean, I think it was, I mean, it was pretty engaging and fascinating. Uh, also very post-apocalyptic. Um, it, it was very lonely and, and, and cold down there. It was, it was positioned next to... Um, something that was like very soft and squishy. So we had this thing that was like totally quantitative. It was about, you know, a spreadsheet driving facades and uh, AIs and data. And we wanted to put it next to some squishy human stuff. And so I'd been working with inflatables a couple of years before um, and using them to encounter the smart, smart, the smart cities to try to figure out how do we like bring humanism into this question of smart cities. Um, and so we had this this is, we called him the sloucher. Here he is. You can see him jiggling to the right. Let me show you what he looks like. He was like bearing witness to the constantly changing seaport facade. Come on, sloucher. There we go. It's like very good shop drawings. Um, so it was, we, we called it user friendly, um, I'm for you, and um, it was responsive, it was, um, you know, it was meant to be um, quite engaging and it did have a responsive aspect to it, but it was really about a sort of witnessing of architecture in a way uh, as well. So I'll just, I'll just run through that a bit. That's what it looks like. There's the sloucher, just hanging out watching the thing. Looks like the, I think it looks like the facades, it looks like a little building. Tied down by a rock. And everything, that was when everything was um, really going downhill and we actually assembled this thing in, a, in an abandoned movie theater um, up above. So we have some great shots from up above. So anyway, sometimes practice is about criticism, sometimes it's about analysis, and sometimes in my mind it's about reseeing. So it's not only about making things but also trying to understand them better through the act of design. All right, and, and finally, um, okay, um, I'll show one last project. Um, this is, I, I, I really struggle with um, the conversation that we've been having around complexity over the past two days. I find it really hard to hold it all at the same time. Um, and in the work that follows, I'm going to show you something that I, that's very small. It operates as a room or a fragment to fill in gaps, uh, and, and, and then it scales. So it kind of hovers between the scale of this little thing. It says uh, room, fragment, unit on one side, and what you can't see on the other side um, is city. 
So it hovers between the, the really, really small and the vast, and it kind of skips over that problematic middle scale. So I just avoided that conversation altogether. Um, it's something small and simple, but networked. It's a small bit of beauty available to more people than would normally have access to it. Um, it's a home, actually. It's a very small home, so it provides security in uncertain times. And I hope it becomes about building less and filling in gaps. It also um, actively, very actively operates not only at this scale, but very much in all of these frameworks. We're actually designing not only the home itself, but the policy actually has already gone through um, for it, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the technology that goes into it, so it is, it is responsive, um, but in a very dumb way. We're trying to make dumb technology. Um, and Capital Sachs, we're actually designing a financial product. So how did it start? It started with Plan Mattapan. My firm was responsible for uh, neighborhood uh, design and for the, for the city of Boston um, through the Boston Planning and Development Agency. And our responsibility was to redesign all of the low-rise urban fabric. Um, and 95% of this plan was, in fact, low-rise urban fabric. This is an historically black and immigrant community um, just inside the area of Boston. It's an historically redlined community, meaning that it's been marginalized using all kinds of things, including uh, capital, um, to, to uh, marginalize the community over the years. And there is a great fear in the community of displacement for, for good reason. The market hasn't tipped yet, but um, that one of the questions on our mind was, how do we stabilize that, that neighborhood and how do we use housing to do so? Um, just to give you a sense, this is what the, the typical housing types look like. There are three flats, or we call them triple deckers in Boston. Um, and they tend to be on pretty big lots, actually. So there are a lot of these three flats. There are a lot of two flats as well. Um, but there's a lot of space left over, as you will see here. Yeah, so you can see this is the kind of urban fabric that we were dealing with. Um, and so we, we worked, this, this also was happening during COVID, so it took a really long time. Um, we started out in person and had a lot of public meetings, and it all went on pause. Um, but what we ultimately came down to after many years, actually, of working on this was a sort of bottom-up design process. We were, we were trying to catalyze change by enabling small-scale infill and gap-filling by and for the community as a way to reduce the risk of displacement, increase local equity, um, and enable the kinds of bu building types that really fit the community. So in this case, it was multi-generational households, single mother households. Um, it was a kind of virtuous cycle of um, if we could just allow for um, if we could just allow for um, these little additional dwelling units to go in people's backyards. This th at that time it was like not that many people were doing it. This is definitely not radical now. ADUs are being like approved statewide um, all over the place now. But at that time, you know, and still in Boston, people are really worried about this. So what you're seeing on the left, we did a little bit of spatial analysis, and basically they're like, there's like 3,000 units that, you, that could be put in Mattapan if, if additional dwelling units were enabled. That's like a lot of units. That's a lot more housing for people's nieces and nephews. Um, and the, the homeowners tend to be people like this woman. They tend to have a lot of equity in their home. Um, they tend to house their families. Um, and they really are quite entrepreneurial. They want to develop it. So there was a lot of enthusiasm in Mattapan for this, for, for doing self-development and taking on um, that work on their own. So, um, so the city was like, great, let's do it. And we're like, great, let's do it. So let's bridge this into another scope of work. Let's actually design a very small home. Let's do this, and then, and then everyone can have homes and it'll be great. Um, so we looked into it, and actually it turns out it's really complicated. Um, so in order to deliver this thing, which is hopefully dignified, delightful, and low energy, um, and have it be accessible to multi-generational households with equity but no cash, um, this is basically more naturally occurring housing. Um, and to make it easy to rent and simple and cheap to maintain, it turns out you have to get involved in a lot of stuff. Um, the resolution is not superb on this, so I'm going to just talk through a little bit. Um, basically, what you're seeing is that there is an entire, there's an infrastructure of policy, there is an infrastructure of capital, so we needed to create a, a funding pool, we needed to, there, loans don't even exist for these things, so we now have to bring together banks and convene banks to create loans, or we have to create a fund, which we still might do. 
Um, and we have to start thinking about all of the technology and data that comes in and out of that house, because in order to qualify for a bunch of federal subsidies so that people can afford it, this also has to be low energy and it has to be easy to maintain. Um, so, and there's a whole social dimension to this too that maybe I'll, I'll skip for right now. The really high level point here is that it turns out it's really complicated even though it's a small house. Because it is, you have to get involved in these systems. This is what the house looks like. It's a lovely little plan. Very small, it's just 900 square feet. That's what it looks like, it's just a house. But it turns out it's a house that um, had to take on a lot of other stuff. Market-driven urbanism, the housing crisis, machine learning, climate change acceleration, social inequity, systemic loneliness. Like it wasn't a simple thing actually, this little house. And we don't want to do it just once, right? We want to do it um, many, many times. And so um, as we dial back into this, um, we are right now working directly with the city of Boston. Um, and so what you'll see here in the next slide, um, we ended up passing zoning for it, so that's great. Um, and we have convened the banks and we have convened local builders. The banks have agreed to create a product we're trying to create a fund for these things. Um, so it'll be a vertically integrated home that's attached to financing, um, attached to a set of tools to help people understand what their financial opportunities are, um, and, uh, and a variety of other things that will kind of make it go. But at the end of the day, it, was, it became a stack that was about changing policy, uh, changing uh, design and the way that we think about design, uh, and also aligning capital with it. Okay, yes, punchline capital. Capital turned out to be the big thing. And it still is the big thing. Capital and labor. Um, is it gonna work? Uh, it's a great animation, guys. Um, I'll describe it. This is a capital stack tool. Um, what we, re we did a lot of research and we continue to do a lot of research. Oh, there it goes. And what we're trying to do is help people come on in the most approachable, approachable way possible, understand what kind of subsidies and grants they qualify for, understand how their financial condition can plug in and support the ADU development, and then understand where they need to get to and how they can have access to the labor so this can be a much more turnkey operation. And I never thought I would be designing a financial technology, but... Um, I will say, it turns out that in order to make these, to make the architecture happen in the way that we thought was just and decent and fair uh, and equitable, we actually had to redesign the systems. Um, so right now we are about to pilot three things. We're looking for funders. We might have one, but if anyone has any good ideas, let me know for those first three. Um, we're gonna do three across three different forms of construction. We're trying to figure out the best way to deal with um, both design delivery, it, the balance basically of cost, time, and local labor and how to integrate local labor. And so what you see here is just an analysis of that. I'm not gonna go over it. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this too. Uh, there's a bunch of computer stuff involved. There's a bunch of data and energy things. Okay, um, so in closing, um, I really like Louise Bourgeois. This is her project Femme Maison uh, from 1946 and 1947. It's a series of work. Um, in it, the house is a kind of stand-in for the social structures that both enable and limit our capacity. I like the infrastructural neutrality of this work, that design is a mechanism by which we experience the world that is a physical, social, and psychological thing and that a home is more than a home. It can keep us cloistered or it can become a mechanism for interconnectivity and expansion into our world. Um, I think this is true for the project that I just showed and I also think it's true for this moment um, as, as architects as well. Um, here are some, uh, yep, there are some, um, some sources that, that um, I might share with you later but I think I'm running over so I'm gonna keep on going. I'm gonna skip this, and I'm just gonna land on this, and um, maybe we can uh, leave this up for the conversation that follows. Um, I, I think, for me, I'm, I'm really left with more questions than answers. Um, I, I think what I really wanna know is how do we return to our desks and act once we understand all these things about agency and values and the context. Um, diagnosing design as a problem just isn't enough. Uh, we really do need better solutions, and we need to make them actionable. 
who will pay us, for instance, to design if our clients are serving a value system that primarily prioritizes profit and efficiency and we want to do something else? These are the questions that keep me up at night, and I think they're hard problems. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves about how design functionally operates. How do we balance systems level action in the face of rigid path dependencies and complexity of a myriad entangled relationships with issues of delight, beauty, and local culture? Um, we need new methods for this, and I think we need to trust our intuition. I think maybe there's a radical pragmatism needed to operate upon and within systems to create deep change while maintaining design intuition and our valuable role as cultural producers. Um, so something like meaningful inefficiencies in the, in the face of, inefic of efficiencies. So I, I apologize for going over and for my technical delays. Um, I hope we still have time for a conversation, and thank you so much for having me. Have a seat. Yeah, we have two more panelists to join you. Um, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Um, very intriguing and honest um, as a non designer. I'm not a trained as an architect. So uh, we have about another 40 minutes or 45 minutes or so for a panel discussion. Uh, please welcome Michael Luth, thank you, and Michael Butterworth. We have two Michaels here um, to join us as the panel. We will take questions from the audience and also uh, from Zoom. So please, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to use the mic. And of course, um, I'm also encouraging the panelists to make some open remarks to reflect um, on the presentation. Hi there. Um, so I guess I just want to challenge um, the idea of artificial nature a little bit and uh, why you uh, choose to separate humans from nature. I don't think it's a separation of humans from nature. I think it's, I, I think it's an idea about deep hybridity, but it's still an acknowledgement that humans are creating, I mean, we're putting new things, in, we have an idea about the world. We do, and we are changing it. Um, I, I don't. I kind of reject the Anthropocene as a concept um, in general. It feels very human centric, but I, I also don't think we can get away from the idea that we are imagining a better world all the time. And I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, and it's not. It, it feels. Um, it feels different to me than the creation of a biological instrument. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily separate. Um, but it does feel like we're operating and imagining in a different way. Is that fair? Does that feel fair? Yeah. I, I, I still need to think about it a little bit, to be honest with you. But it's a tricky one for me. It's tricky because it's it's a... It's, it's a non-binary thing that yet still feels shapeable. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, still s digesting a lot of the, the talk, but I, I, I can't get it out of my head because as I was on here, on my way here from uh, practice, seeing the, the continuous facade project, is there any extension on that in terms as a design tool going forward. I only ask because I can't get it out of my head in terms of a tileable SketchUp like texture. I was working on that today, and it's kind of fascinating when they jam up a little bit in those little weird kind of moments. And I'm just wondering if there's any sort of extension to that tileable facade project that you're working with, maybe um, as a design tool I, I for like reimagining. I like this idea. I mean, we did. Um, I, what I didn't show today is. Um, a tool that I showed at the Maxi Museum in Rome around the same time. 
And it was actually, um, <laughs> it, was, um, it was very similar because yeah. it was an auto-generated facade. Yeah. But um, it was questioning the idea, it was a little bit different, it was questioning the idea of authorship. And so you would show up at the exhibition and there would be a computer, computer vision understanding of your face. Mm. And then based upon your face, a triple decker would come out. And it was kind of this idea, it was like, well, who's authoring this, yeah. you know? Who yeah. is it? Is yeah. Who's the designer here? Is it yeah. the, ar the architect who made the triple deckers? Is right. it the person who just showed up with their face because they have a, you know, like a smile on today and red yeah. hair? Like, I don't know. So I, I think there's, I, I think there, and you know, of course, everyone was like, oh, well, could we turn this into a community engagement project? And I mean, I think it's, I, I like the idea of it very much. Um, but I, I, I like them as it's critical it's pieces right now. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, n nothing in the works yet. But I like this idea. Maybe now, maybe now yeah, I will. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, I want to backtrack a little bit to Michael's first comment. I think why, uh, I know why he asked that question, because he's researches on biomaterials. Um, and it's the very notion of combining living things with buildings. Um, is that why you're asking that question? So tell us more about what you think, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah, I got a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I guess it's like, uh, it's a big question, isn't it? It is, it's um, <laughs> cause It's almost like a meta question in some ways, because I think it really changes the the relationship of how we interact with systems or what those systems mean. And I, you know, I think it, it's very easy to, to see us as a very separate species, a very separate entity that moves through the world. Um, but the truth is everything around us is interacting with their environments and creating yeah. their environments. You know, like uh, even the idea of plant succession, you know, the, yeah. the, the change of the varieties of plants that are happening are eventually alter microclimate and uh, you know, in some ways, it almost feels like a bit of an arrogance to say that we are the yeah. we are different than nature in, mm -hmm. in some ways. And um, I think I see maybe, you know, integrating ourselves with nature might uh, lend ourselves to having a different process to to create these things that we want to make or these different yeah. systems and, and be more in sync with them. Um, and I guess I think a lot about. Um, uh, I, I don't like to use the word traditional architectures, but some of like these older examples that we're now sort of re finding again that uh, really work with the climate of the area, you know, rather than trying to have very complicated facades that do different things. You know, the building just, it came from a place that was dry and it had to, you know, there, was, there wasn't enough technology to overcome that to, to meet, you know, 22.3 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. in the building. And so, um, yeah, I guess um, that's, a, I think, a headspace I try to get into. I wonder, I mean, so our art, artificial nature obviously is a play on it because it's a, a play on like, is it separate or is it, are they together? Mm -hmm. um, um, obviously my statement around designers as creating the artificial is something I would say an ampli like a, a, diff a difference from that. I mean, it's, it's interesting because like on one hand I could just say, well, sure, everything is natural or everything is artificial. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really easy to do. I also you know, think that we have a, a like, there is a, there's a will um, to imagine a collective social future that is continuous, like we are deciding that we want it to be different than it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like I can't get away from that either. It's a, I have a tension with it. Um, and I, I can't, um, I wrote a lot about this art artificial question. Um, earlier this year and I, I can't get down yet with everything being, I mean, th there's a spectrum 100%, but I can't quite get there. And I know it's fashionable to be there, but I'm not there yet. Yeah, it's almost it's like there are a moral imperative or, yeah. or something, like uh, maybe like do we have a responsibility that we're different? Like it's interesting thinking about, uh, I can't remember where I saw this, but talking about different animals that have uh, similar or larger brains uh, size-wise compared to humans, but perhaps they don't have the articulating thumbs. And so, our, you know, our our ability to impact the earth around us is different than other creatures that maybe don't have that physical capacity or something. So, yeah, it's like who, who we became the stewards because of, you know, our ability to make change. But this, this um, um, Donna Haraway in um, um, 
Uh, the um, staying with the trouble. Mm -hmm. I liked what she was talking about. I mean, it was sort of a, a continuation of her conversation about companion species, and so she uses like the carrier pigeon. And she talks a lot about becoming with. And I, I think, you know, and I've noticed a couple of other people have talked about this. It's a very powerful concept. This idea that yes, we are, we are making change, but so is the carrier pigeon, you know? Is the carrier pigeon imagining like their relationship with God while they're doing it? I don't, you know, mm -hmm. probably not, but that's, I don't, but does it matter? I don't know, you right. know? I, 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 it's, I was like, I remember running while I was reading that and while I was listening to it on tape. I was like, God, this is like kind of mind blowing. Let's see what else I've got here. <laughs> Does anyone else have thoughts on the artificial? We're different, yeah. Yeah, of course, the irony being that we're actually doing that work, which is different than everything else, but whatever. Yeah, it's, I, I, I think it's a great point, though. Yes. Yeah, let me, let me try to take another stab at it. Um, imagining something that doesn't exist for me is the imagination of the artificial. That doesn't mean that we're not on a continuous spectrum with every other species that exists, including artificial intelligence in some way, shape, or form. Um, but the possibility of imagining a, a, a world that is different from our own and then executing it, uh, that is the artificial to me. I don't know that it needs to be different. I, 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 don't, I honestly don't know that it needs to be different from nature. I think it, I, and I'm talking at both sides here because it's something that I'm wrestling with. Um, I think we are, a, 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 I do think we're, we are becoming with nature and we are because we are part of it. I don't, I don't think it's such a, I don't see it as a, as a hard binary, but I also do see what we do as artificial. Um, so I don't know if it's, if, if it's right to create the binary between natural and artificial, even though I played on that in the exhibition title. Um, but I, I can't get away from this idea that what we're making, that what we do is create the artificial. It, it feels like the creation of something fundamentally um, separate than the reality we live in. I don't know if that answers your question, but. I mean, that definitely makes us different. That's sort of the model of the Anthropocene, I think. I think that's within the model of this idea that we're now in the age of humanity and that we're, because of this, this trend, you know, we've, we've gotten ourselves into a, a paradigm. I think Haraway makes the point that it's rather self-centric to think about our, our, ourselves as 
being so in control, um, which maybe is to, to your earlier points as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an undeniable kind of condition. Yeah, and maybe to, to play on that a little bit too, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about quality of living, not necessarily like standards of living, but like quality of life, which I think is a, a more difficult uh, thing to put to metric, uh, put a metric to. And um, it just seems like there's a continuous push to have a more energy intensive lifestyle. Um, and, and even, I mean, these are conversations coming up with AI models that we're using where um, the, like the amount of energy required to power these models is astronomical. And, um, um, you know, and I guess our buildings begin to reflect that too, where uh, in some of the models you were showing, there's a very complicated uh, layer of technology to keep them, uh, or to keep, I guess, the environment inside uh, somewhere that we would like to be. And um, I wonder if you can maybe, if you have some thoughts about sort of, uh, like our driving forward, uh, like a need for more energy, but does that actually like improve our life more than like a, an older building that might not have so much? Like, uh, I guess that idea of do we get the temperature exactly where we need or do we just put on a sweater? Like is, is, that a, is our life better for that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there are two things wrapped up in that one is this kind of idea of valuing like time and quality. And then the other one is um, <clears throat> I think maybe about like the extent to which technology is a solution. Um, the first, I think, is is sort of wrapped up in this degrowth question. I, I don't know how many of you have, have read about this, um, but it's it's generally the idea that we should be measuring um, our um, we should be measuring our lives not in gross domestic product, but in like time value, like how how much quality, like how high quality is our life, and like what are we spending our time doing, and so how do we kind of reverse the metrics and change them around a little bit. Um, so that, that feels like, I, I, I like that dynamic. I like this idea that we could be thinking about quality more and we could be thinking about what makes our life high quality and, and, and valuable in different ways. Um, maybe bridging into the question about technology then and like how technology might assist in doing that. Um, you know, our, our, our environmental crisis is really big. I just think it's um, inadvisable to become uh, to reject technology as a solution. I also think overly complicated architecture is insane. Um, that's why I was like, I wanna make a dumb house. You know, I want a dumb house. And I want a dumb house that is as energy efficient as possible. And then I can just like open a window when, you know, there's like, there's too much CO2 and like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But it's, it wouldn't be a bad thing to understand that you're going to need to slowly turn on your heating because there's going to be a cold snap and you don't want to do it all at once and waste a bunch of energy. Yeah. So I think there's got to be some bad, it's like how dumb can we make it while still being as energy efficient as possible? And that's why I, with that, that slide where I was like, I need to go through this too fast and there was like a weird hand pushing something soft. Um, that's actually a, computer, a human computer interaction problem um, because suddenly now the, the stuff that we're designing is not just solving problems of architecture, it's solving problems of human computer interaction. And so the question is how can we make it not as like seamless as possible, actually quite the opposite. How can we design the friction in so that we're aware of what we're doing in more ways? I think that's more interesting a little bit. Yeah. It's easy to talk about at the scale of a single house. I think it's a lot harder at the scale of a gigantic building. I, I, I teach in a passive building. It's very problematic, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but we're getting there, I think, you know. We're getting there. But what does it mean? So, hi. So um, on one of your slides here, you wrote, um, uh, design is dialogic, design is biased. And then what caught my eye was uh, design is by and for humans, a search for meaning. And I think that ties into where you're going with and where this conversation is going in terms of natural and artificial and these sorts of things. And it kind of gets back to like, if a tree falls in the forest, does anyone hear it? So um, can you expand on meaning and how it relates to your lecture this evening? 
Yeah. Um, I believe that what we're engaged in is a pursuit in search of human meaning. I believe that that's what design is. I can't think of a single act of design that isn't actually in some way, shape, or form about human meaning. Um, it can be about optimizing the market. It can be about lower energy. It can be about all of these different things. But at the end of the day, I think it still is at the service of something that is going to be um, help us to understand who we are in the world and who we want to be as a society. And I think also um, it's easy to get caught up in all the smaller factors and sort of miss the, the larger picture. Um, you know, uh, so um, finding that meaning could be part of what it is to be human, right? And so instead of um, uh, focusing on the smaller components, if we can bring it all back around to something significant and meaningful and, and those sorts of things, then it kind of um, will steer all the smaller decisions into a bigger decision. And in a way, I'm going to argue right now on the spot that that kind of brings it back to being natural again. What are your thoughts on that? I didn't fully follow, I'm going to admit. <laughs> say it one more time, say it one more time. <laughs> Where I'm going with this is that um, when we're in the office or, or uh, you know, dealing with code, right, and all of these sorts of things, um, you, you can get um, caught up in the smaller details. You can get f really hyper-focused on the minutia. <laughs> And you can talk about uh, embodied energy and carbon footprints and various things like this. And it's easy, I find, I can only speak for myself, that um, it's easy to get caught up in the smaller components. And that could seem, in some ways, dealing with artificial components like technical components, code components, or those sorts of things. But really, I think uh, society and human and, our, and designers' quest for finding meaning in our work is a natural part of what we do, and oftentimes we can lose sight of that because we get yeah. caught up in the smaller things. Yeah. yeah. I'm totally with you. <laughs> I totally agree. I mean, I, I, no, I, I, I do, I, but maybe this is this moment, you know? I think that's such an optimistic thing to say, that like, like what we do is so important, you know? And it's so optimistic, like, it's so optimistic. I mean, we are like just, we're trying to make things better, you know? And I think trying to figure out how we kind of, like what is our position from which we can collectively operate? I think it's, I think it's actually about the values too. Like what can we agree upon and what can we, um, what can we agree is like what we want together. Uh, there's something in it there. I do worry though, there's a flip side to it. Did I put that on the screen? No, I guess I put it on the last um, slide. Sometimes I worry that design is both everything and nothing. Like design is everything. It's what we do as humans. But that's not what we do as architects. We don't do everything, you know? And then we end up having these big design thinking movements where we're doing this like massive cross-disciplinary activity and we're like, we're gonna solve the problems of the world through design, you know? Um, and then it completely weakens our position from which to act. So I think trying to figure out, to your point, how we balance the, the, the sometimes obscure craft-based techniques with their, their end, which is the, the creation of something meaningful, that connection feels like it's a little bit broken, but it seems like the thing that we need to do, which is really still dial into our expertise and our disciplinary core, but understand how it connects back, I think. I like that comment, though. Thank you. Could I, could I add to that? Um, I'm wondering about maybe the question of um, maybe if meaning is added to the if it's not already added to the the, the left-hand column, I'm, I'm trying to remember the diagram, but meaning, oh, yeah. uh -huh. the and binaries. then the production of architecture on the right-hand column, and then the, the ways that it's mediated, or the ways that we have to operate through to navigate that gulf between the, the conditions and the production. I'm curious about the diagram itself, actually, in a way, because the middle stack, so technology stack, um, political or uh, policy and I can't think of the C capital capital um, it seems like there's a conspicuous gap below just in the way that that diagram is constructed and almost suggesting an, an other or even a bypass 
very that insightful. might exist. And I'm wondering what you, what you think about that gap that you've built into your, into your diagram about that mediation. I have a lot of thoughts about it. It's a very smart comment. Um, what I didn't show is a little triangle that goes underneath it, which says bottom-up design. Um, because I think that um, while there are the dominant pressures and the, the sort of constructs of power that we operate with and that create the path dependencies, um, there is also another very powerful thing, which is bottom-up power. And this question of how human and non-human actors have agency outside of those constructs. And it's not small. So that's actually what I think. Um, and I didn't include it because it's a more complicated conversation. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important. Do you, maybe to follow up, how do you consider that then in your pedagogy and um, maybe more in your pedagogy? I think you've explained yeah. a lot of it in sort of some of those examples of your practice, but um, what about in your pedagogy? Yeah, so um, I, I like the idea of an engaged practice. And by engaged practice, I don't mean that we're designing community engagement processes, though sometimes we do that too. What I mean is that we are deeply engaged not only in the creation of form and space, but in the ways that that form and space is connected to and shaping the things around it. And so actually, I have a good example. I have a good example, it's a great example. Um, I almost put it in the presentation, actually. So uh, Tuesday, what day is today? Yes, on Tuesday, um, my students engaged in a workshop called a counterfactual workshop. The general idea was that um, we put on the table um, what would have happened if the OPEC negotiations to the 1974 oil crisis failed? What would our built environment, we were specifically looking at infrastructures of transportation, what would our built environment look like? So there are some ways in which we can kind of play things out. So there's a kind of analytic, like an imaginative analytic aspect to this that I think is actually really important to be able to get ourselves somehow um, into, it, it, it's funny because you can, you're lifting yourself out of the architectural scale and into these kind of complicated dynamics, but by playing that game and reconstructing an alternative present, you're very quickly understanding all the dynamics at play that have ultimately come down and created the world that we live in right now and even at the scale of the site. So there's something about understanding it and methods for understanding that um, some of which are like quite uh, you know, straightforward, rigorous, and analytical uh, quantitatively, and some of which are actually about engaging design imagination. Um, so we look, a lot at, we look at methods a lot. Um, th this kind of question of how much you balance methods and intuition, I think is, is, is fascinating. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, the, the, I don't know which, uh, you, you don't have access to your slides here easily, but you're, you know, the, you showed a, a wonderful slide of uh, the work that you and your colleagues were doing, and you're mapping out whether it was a, a one-off or whether it was largely scalable, the whole scalability slide. and and. Uh, I would like to know more about this notion of scalability in relation to sustainability. Scalability. What was that about? Was that the systems map thing? <laughs> Your colleague's oh, yeah, 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 research. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And and that scalability is is an important aspect, a, a shared. Uh, a, Byproduct of all of your work that it was scalable. Mm -hmm. Well, is scalability something? Is that like a notion that Henry Ford invented? Is that what we're getting at? That we can replicate something, and and that is somehow for the greater good, or is scalability something that we can uh, sort of consider in the nature of of how our world works? Yeah, it's a our natural systems work. Yeah, you know? no, and I think it, does it have uh, you know, what is its entropic consequence? Well, I won't go there, you can. But uh, scalability is really the question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it's like the most challenging question of my personal practice and that design faces right now. 
Um, no, I don't think we can replicate market dynamics. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that we want to create a neo-Fordist regime of design. That doesn't seem appropriate. Um, but I do like what, uh, what um, Anna Singh is saying. I think what she's saying, uh, what she's getting at, uh, she, she writes this, this, this book um, that I showed, The Mushroom at the End of the World, and it's this story about the Matsutake mushroom and how uh, she highlights and daylights processes, actually that are very much involved in capitalism, but she shows them in a much more, I would say, messy, complex, and fraught way. She shows how um, the, the um, human creativity is involved, how friction is involved within the systems, how there are actually self-limiting systems, how they take advantage of, um, uh, how they actually become resilient. So scale is not something that is stamping things out as in a, a Fordist model, but is actually growing and changing and uh, morphing and in, and in fact can become self-limiting. So I do think, um, I do think we need better research into what scalability means in design. And um, I, I mean, I, I, I believe that I, I'm, I, I will defend scalability in design 100% because that's what agency is about, I think. I think agency is about how you can create change. And I don't want to create this much change. I want to create this much change. And in order to do that, I have to find some way to think about scalability. And whether that's a scalability of an idea or whether it's um, a, a, a thing that changes in relationship to a set of systems over time. I think there are different ways we can interpret it and it needs work, but um, I think I'm in the Anna Singh camp. The, the microphone, but um, do you, can you name some of the other projects that your colleagues were working on in that wonderful matrix? Yeah, it, that were, um, yeah, the, gosh, there were so many. Um, there were a set of projects that I did not show that were really, really deep quantitative analyses of meta urban metabolism um, that were looking at comparatively across cities how uh, energy and resources were being used in, in, in these beautiful Sankey diagrams by Peter Rowe. Um, a colleague of mine, Carol Volgaris, was looking at analysis of existing standards and criticizing them and basically saying, listen, if you're gonna measure this stuff, you gotta stop measuring things because you're measuring it wrong and you're, you're as a result, we're rec recreating and replicating the world in a really unhealthy way. So there's a criticism of standards. Um, what are some of the really meaningful ones? Um, I think the work of um, Craig and Rose and Malkeet was really remarkable. What I didn't show is their, th this hybrid quantitative qualitative analysis um, that they were doing at this like state level. Um, and they basically wrapped together a bunch of uh, uh, methods that I think were, were quite powerful. There were mangroves, robots. There were like, there's so much stuff, yeah. Since we're on that diagram, um, <laughs> what struck me was that all the research that was on the left on the small, small side of the scale was architecture research. And all the work that was on the right-hand side, which was large scale, was landscape architecture projects in the same faculty. And I'm curious about that because it would, seems to me that if we had more landscape architecture in the small and more architecture in the large, we would have more hybridization of methods and concepts and ways of working, which might give us more scalability yeah. and maybe more agency as designers. So why this, this kind of sharp dichotomy in the research activities, if I read the diagram right? Yeah, maybe Gareth has some opinions about this too. Um, could, could in the, um, could, would you mind trying to find a slide that has the X and Y axis on it? It's about halfway through the slides. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't disagree with you. We have this landscape urbanism thing happening at the GSD, so they tend to be operating at fairly large scales. Um, but the, um, the the Oasis project, I think, is a really good example, actually, of a technology that, if we look at it, it actually operates at the scale of like well, it's an oasis, right? So it's like a it's a scale of a, of, a, of a village or a small urban area, but it can also be interpreted as operating at the scale of um, like now I'm not a landscape architect, so I'm out of my depth here, but like basically the way that water interacts with soil and plants, hydrology, something like this. Um, so so there's, something, there's something there, but I, what I really resonate with in your question is, is how we can share methods. Um, Gareth taught this class that I took, 
when I was a student called Ecological Urbanism, and it also ended in an exhibition. And it really opened my eyes to this idea of um, methods of analysis and ways of reseeing the world, um, which was a great class care, so thank you. Um, and I, I feel that, that that, this idea of reseeing, that is, I think, m largely being pioneered in landscape architecture, a bit in urbanism, but I think it's really that landscape is doing a great job, is just we could just absolutely adopt that in architecture and we should talk more about it. I mean, I, I, it, it is too siloed. I think it is too siloed. You're, you're not wrong. Oh, yeah, there it is. So you guys can see the disciplines. So the, um, these are the disciplines here. So, um, so square is architecture. Um, I believe that the circle, I can barely see it on the screen, landscape. And then the triangle is urbanism. So yeah, urbanism is like hovering over here. You're right, architecture is absolutely over here. A lot of that's like materials research and stuff too. But you're right, could you go next? I have a question. If, um, when you showed me this, uh, the facade and you made this exhibition installation, um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with my students. Um, I don't know if they remember, I remember. Um, also with my colleague about this, the difference between evidenced or data-driven design versus design-based evidence. Um, because I think most of us um, use data and evidence to support either prior or, or post-rationalize. But I, you know, as an outsider, not a designer, I don't see much work being done coming from the opposite side. Um, how can we evaluate the impact of de design or should we evaluate, uh, how can we measure it? Like post-occupancy stuff? Yeah, or you know, through installations and you know, how, because the work that the design that you've done is based on someone else's design, um, which is the design-based data. So the question is a little bit like, why aren't we doing more of the, why aren't we kind of uh, understanding the, the architecture more after the fact kind of situation? Yeah, yeah and yeah. You know, one yeah. of the diagram you also showed, you know, before and after as the field evolves. And I almost want to draw a line from the far right back to the architects. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I actually started my career, um, um, I dropped out of art school, and I ended up in London doing research for a design firm, and um, that design firm happened to be called DEGW, and they were one of the first um, firms that did, um, like, workplace analysis, and um, it was a lot of post-occupancy work, so I spent, like, a year just doing post-occupancy research and data collection on on buildings, and I n have never worked anywhere or done any work since that has involved that, I think, um, largely because it turns out it's not profitable, unfortunately, um, but it's needed. Um, I will say there is an interesting exception to this around um, digital twins. Um, and it gets into slightly different territory, but I'm gonna go down this pathway because I actually think it's important with respect to agency. Yep. Um, so digital twins, as you might know, are the sort of um, the exact likeness of a building in digital space. Architects produce models in BIM, right, in Revit, um, to a certain level of detail because that reduces our liability. We can't go past a certain level of detail because we don't want to tell the contractors how to build a building, right? But what that means is that the contractor then picks up our documents, our, our models, and creates a new model that can faithfully represent the building as it's actually built. And rapidly, we're being able to run building performance modeling through that to understand how a building is operating as part of building management systems. And the contractors are owning that, and they're getting paid a lot of money for it. Um, we've kind of designed ourselves out of that, unfortunately, um, because, of the, um, because of professional liability. So there are some big questions there with respect to agency that I don't know if you guys are interested in, but it's on my mind, and I do think that, that that's a huge pathway in terms of understanding, I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely there. I mean, mm -hmm. the house zero that we showed, um, you know, whether or not you like smart homes, um, you know, it, it, it has a, a, a digital twin and it can be measured and they know exactly how it has performed and they're able mm -hmm. to like endlessly optimize for yep. it. Yep. So it's... It is actually one of my research interests. Um, 
and I read this article about digital twin, um, not from the building scale, but at the city scale, because city technically is also a machine to a certain extent. Um, but the, the author, I forgot his name, he mentioned that there's the paradox in terms of the amount of data we have versus the amount of knowledge we can generate. So the current state of digital twin is really, really good at measuring physical interactions of different building components. So your heating, your cooling, but it has, rarely the people attempt to measure how people would use the building. And the paradox comes in when we have more human data into the model, the less we actually know about the model. So, um, yeah. That's the, you're saying at the scale of a building, the more human data we have, the less we know about the model? Yeah, because we, uh, I think the current development of um, systemized or datafying this process, uh, we don't know it. We don't, we have limited knowledge in terms of how people would use uh, the building. Uh, so for example, you can have, you know, the best light bulbs in the house, but if you keep your lights on all the time, it's still going to drain energy. Yeah. And it's difficult to model that. I mean, I do think there's a really, really big difference between measuring um, energy and systems and measuring human behavior. So that that's maybe something to be said. There's a whole history of measuring human behavior that comes out of William White and um, his work in New York um, around public spaces and this sort of, um, the way that we can begin to translate and count the things that we wanna see more of and translate those into data, which I suppose maybe rubs up against the way that humans use or don't use mm -hmm. um, energy resources, but it's, it is radically different. I mean, they're just they're just different animals. I think mm -hmm. I, I I don't know. I haven't I haven't done a lot. I have to admit I've done a lot on the data around human metrics and urban scale data, and I'm significantly less interested, ironically, um, in building performance modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, um, my name is Riley. I'm currently a student in the environmental design program. Uh, I was really fascinated by a few of the concepts you touched on in your presentation, particularly how the computer is no longer sort of the slave to design um, and how designers are the amplification of existing and sort of progressing value systems. One curiosity I had is as artificial intelligence sort of progresses from a tool of design to more so a colleague of design, how do you see that enabling or potentially taking away from that amplification of those value systems. Okay, so so the question is, um, once um, once we move, at, once we change our relationship to AIs and we think about them more as companions, um, how does, say, and then say the last part one more time. How do you see that impacting the amplification of those value systems, the progression of those value systems? Yeah, okay, right, so then what does it do to value systems? Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting question. Um, so I think that the I, um, I have this great set of slides that I use to talk about this because I love this topic. Um, what we what the, the, remember that process that I showed the process model where you have the architects and then you have the community and data and all of the stuff and then human machine hu machine machine all that stuff. Actually, the first thing that we do before we run anything through a system or before we create a model or before we collect data, we actually design that process. Like you have to, you don't have a choice. And so it's actually the values that are embedded in that process that are the most important thing. And those are, that's actually pretty much a human decision. It's like, what is the data we collect? What is the data we leave out? What is, what is it that we're counting? How are we counting it? How are we allowing it to interact with other humans and other machines? So there are all of these kind of subtle questions about actually the de design of the model itself that I think actually has the, the, the values baked into it, I think. Um, so, and I'm not sure, like I don't know what it means yet to have an AI companion rather than an AI consultant. Like I just, I haven't quite, I don't, my brain is not big enough yet. Maybe one day it will be. I don't know yet. Um, but I do think it's really, really important to say that the human decisions that go into the models themselves, I think are the most important. 
I think they're the most important things. I think. Thank you. I had a question about uh, uh, collaboration with non-human things. Um, how does that come into your design process? A couple of ways. Um, so you saw a little bit the the work that I that I did with the with the just the really simple image-based neural net. Um, so it, I, I like the idea that that we can use it as a form of criticism and a form of analysis. And I'll like amplify that even a little bit more. So let's say that instead of cataloging facades in the seaport, I cataloged plans that form the basis for the canon of architecture as we know it. And then I also did an analysis of all the triple deckers I was talking about. I'm, I'm wondering if we can understand architecture in an entirely different way. Like, I wonder if we have like an AB. <laughs> we, we look at the canon and then we look at architecture at large. I mean, we can actually re redefine what architecture is in a different, in a, in a way, you know, or we can see it through a different lens. Um, so I think that's very interesting. This idea that we're re-seeing architecture, um, that, that feels fascinating to me. Um, I also, I, I think there's something to be said for the, these dumb buildings. I'm gonna say the dumb building thing again. Um, in addition to trying to understand and, 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 and be critics of our environment, the question of how we make them is really fascinating to me. I'm not that interested in image generated new buildings, they're just images. Yeah. I think it's interesting to create the processes by which we can, again, critique architecture and critique processes, yeah. um, or even begin to patch things together and maybe even have conversations, enable conversations with other humans that weren't otherwise possible through these, you know, through using these models. Um, but I think that ultimately trying to figure out how we can, let's say in the case of this little home, how we can enable people to be, honestly, it's about connection, it's about connectivity. Like what if, this is the question I kept asking yourself, myself, what if, you, what if you, you cared for your home like you care for your pet? What if you have a different relationship with your home? Not that you're humanizing it or something, but it, it's, that it's it, because of the way that you're interacting with it in a different way, because you're able to understand it differently, you're under, able to understand what it needs and you're able to care for it in a different way, we can actually understand our context and, our, and, our, you know, and, and we can feel more secure and we can feel, we can have a higher quality life. Like, that's what I want. Yeah, that feels like an interesting segue to biomaterials and in some ways too, because that really changes, like if your house is growing with you or not growing with you because you're neglecting it or whatever your relationship is. Yeah, I think that can really change that quite a bit. That just sounds so nice, doesn't it? Yeah. I uh, encourage you guys to move the conversation to the bar outside. <laughs> uh, and then we'll come back shortly for Gareth's presentation. So thank you again for the panel thank and the speaker. You.